I just brought you to here because I want to, want to use this as a little example for some of the things that you're working on in your uh, assignment. So have a look at user design, interface design, the things that are used on um, smart devices, location services, all sort of things. You see, you know, you've got this bit moving around all the time and you can't click on it. This bit, you can move around, it keeps moving, and you can't click on it. Why design it like that? If you look at this bit here, your details you fix once a year, as you change houses or something. Your grades possibly look at twice a year after exam boards when you confirmed your grades that you can see on Turnitin. Your timetable, occasionally. Your payment record for your fees and so on. Who's actually looked at that so far this term? Anybody? Have you looked at it more than once? Anybody who's looked at that more than once? Oh, one or two who've got problems, probably. Now, this is the first one that people really use every day. And if we look sideways, your U drive, your personal, yeah, this is where you can store some of your uh, work securely on our server. So that one thing that you really need urgently and regularly is on the second page. And the other thing you use every day is at the bottom of that little list. How would you have designed that, folks? Would you have changed that design at all? The sequence of those? Pardon? You'd have buttons. Good thinking. They wouldn't be scrollable. You wouldn't have to scroll them if they were properly buttoned. Does anybody look at the news central, the news, or these sort of university announcements or social gathering or your voice? Anybody look at that lot? A few of you. Excellent, good. But, you see, if you actually want to do anything, you've got to go up to here, haven't you? So although you see Launchpad there, you actually have to use it there. <coughs> well, then you've got vast amounts of useful stuff there. <coughs> Many of you are going to be <coughs> developing user interfaces. What I'd like you to do it's a f over your next year or so, it's to, as you use all sorts of apps and websites, think very carefully about whether you think it's designed well or not. Does it support you in finding the information quickly or not? And the reason I'm pointing this one out is because we want to go, I want to show you what happens. Or you're going to need to go here for all of the work you're doing or some of the work you're doing for the assignment. And you can go down these individual ones, or you can just go straight to the top level, and then you get all sorts of other things here. And this is a different picture from the one I get. Um, this is the one that you're most likely to want to use, because then you can actually go and find individual journals and such like, or you can search and so on. So, this is where you're going to get most of your sources, although you will find some in the books, whether they're e-books or whether they're paper books. Talking of which, who likes using e-books, the things that turn up on your tablet or your iPad or your phone, as compared to paper? E-books first. Paper books. <coughs> the paper books have it. Now, why do you prefer to have stuff on paper? What is it about paper that attracts you? So that most of you, about three quarters, wanted to have paper books. It's easier to read. Right. Anybody disagree with that? So sometimes it's useful to be able to change a contrast or the text size on an e-reader. Okay, yep. <laughs> because again, you see, that's going to sub um, guide you, or your preference is going to guide you as to how you access lots of the resources you're going to be needing over the next three years or so. 
But this one here, the searching the library catalogues, you'll get a lot of e stuff in terms of e-books and paper books in our library over there. But of course, all the, almost all of our journals are e. You know, you have to get them as PDFs, and then if you want them as paper, you have to print them down, which can be useful. But it's horses for courses. It depends what you're trying to do. And I've got one or two colleagues who love having e-books for doing sort of research or for as technical manuals because you can then search for the tip to do this. Um, but for, <coughs> you might say, leisure reading, those same uh, colleagues will then go to the paper side. And I tend to prefer paper for my, myself, but sometimes if I'm travelling, um, if, if it's a long trip and I need, want to have several books with me, you know, having four or five books, you end up with two or three kilos of books, and that's kind of hard work. Whereas a Kindle or an iPad is nice and light, so we have to think about these sort of things as we develop it, uh, our um, re research patterns and our preferences for doing research effectively and writing. You know, if you've got a paper print of a journal article, you can annotate it, you can stick little sticky notes. Um, along the side, so here is an interesting bit I want to include in my report later on. So, having got the literature through those processes somehow or other, what are you going to do with it? And what I'm going to talk about in this little lecture it relates partly to what you're doing for your article, but also, it's all about researching literature, reviewing literature, as you develop all of your assignments that you're going to be working on, by and large, over the next three, four, three years or so. And I want to look at the question of why, the purpose, do we use academic sources and other sort of professional sources, and how do you then go about doing that review process? Why? It helps you to understand, put a context around your particular piece of work you're doing. It provides the theoretical structure, the framework that you are using to ask your questions as you narrow into your topic and then start developing it. So when we talk about a theory or a theoretical structure, theoretical framework, by and large, we're not saying this is the answer. It's much more to do with these are the really interesting questions that you can ask yourself and you can ask of the context to come up with those great answers which are going to be valuable. Literature research also provides that connection between what you want to study or research and what we already know. All of those publications in the academic journals are based on research. People have done some research, collected data and then done some analysis. And what we like to do, what you need to do, is again move on from there, that's what we already know, so this is what I want to research, to find out an answer about a new question. And the other thing it does, it provides a demonstration of your scholarly ability to go and do research in the literature, find relevant literature that actually is related to what you're trying to do, rather than somewhere off over there, which is completely irrelevant, but it fills up a bibliography, that's not acceptable. But we want you to find relevant literature in your context. And these are some of the sort of questions that you need to ask yourself about your sources. What are the key sources? Who are the key authors, key researchers in the field? Um, what are the big issues? What's already been solved, but what's left outstanding, we don't know the answers to yet. What are the top origins? Where did this topic come from? What are the definitions? Because definitions are really, really important in terms of setting the scene and a common framework of communication, like I mentioned last week. 
what are the key theories, the three key concepts? Again, we want you to find a multiple concepts, multiple uh, perspectives on the theories. And then the epi epistemological and ontological all have to do with meaning and derivation of a problem of a discipline. How has it arisen? Is it based on evidence? So data has been collected and analysed and then things have come from that. Or has it been sort of mathematical <coughs> modelling, thought modelling has led to some ideas which have then been tested by data collection or perhaps just purely by uh, mathematical simulation, mathematical models. What are the structures within the, the domain? Where does the research fit into the different parts of the structures? So if we look at our in, uh, computing, you know, we've got things like computer science, uh, programming, operating systems, communications, and, 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 and. Where does your field fit into that overall framework? <coughs> So understanding these things, doing your literature research, gives, helps you to provide clarity in your focus. It's part of that drunken spider's walk that leads to a really beautiful linear plan from the question, step by step, to the conclusion. What we can also do sometimes with our research is to help improve methodologies. Now if you look at research that was published yesterday, um, or mentioned yesterday in the press and was published in the British Medical Journal about two weeks ago about some research into statins. Every time uh, someone comes up, a researcher comes up with a new paper on statins and whether they're effective for you or not, whether we should be giving it to 12 million people or to 5 million or smaller numbers, it's all to, ultimately much of the debate is about the methodologies of evaluating the impact of statins in reducing uh, cholesterol and doing other things. <clears throat> and people haven't yet untangled all of that. So there's huge amounts of work that could be done to develop the methodology of the research. We are inquisitive, mostly humans are inquisitive. We are curious about how things work, why things work, and why they don't work. <coughs> And so research always helps to expand our knowledge base, our broader understanding of what's going on. And one of the things that you all ought to be doing, and I keep mentioning this, is read, read, read. Subscribe to all of those technical and industry sources. Talk to your lecturers, talk to your program leaders about the set of sources or set of websites you should subscribe to to get a daily or weekly feed that tells you what's going on uh, in the world today. So a nice little item, just to illustrate this, um, today about a little piece of research at Harvard University and they made a little tiny thing, a little about that size, which flies like a bee and can also swim underwater. It can't take off from water yet, that's next week's challenge type of thing. But, you know, these are sort of things that five years ago we never believed could remotely be possible that you get something that tiny actually able to fly, not with a propeller, but with little wings that work just like bees' wings do. Broadens our knowledge of what is feasible, what can actually be done. And the research provides a context that we can use when we've collected some information or some data and helps us to understand the best way that we should analyse that data. This is particularly important to you guys who are doing uh, the IT, BSC IT because that's what you're going to be doing for the next three years in analytics, by and large. A few other things as well, but analytics, the analysis of data, is really important for you lot. But for everybody, you're always going to be acquiring lots and lots and lots of information about things, about how they work, how we think they work, about the theories, and then the questions. And so that helps us to do that analysis in the right context and come to some sensible, logical conclusions. <clears throat> now, I suspect that many of you have fallen into this already, or to some extent. 
you need to have some research to know what the question is, but you need to know what the question is in order to start doing the research. This is the research paradox. And this is where I've suggested to pretty much most of you during the workshops, what do you already know about the topic that you've chosen, whether it's location services, whether it's a fraud, <coughs> it's side, whether it's uh, AI and learning, machine learning, or whether it's that sort of social networks and smart devices. I try to get you to start with your current knowledge that you already understand about some of those things. Just because you're interested in them, because you've done some reading about it, or you just happen to remember some reports you've written, uh, read. And that helps you to get into the literature, whether it's the professional press, whether it's Google Scholar, Google, or the academic journals, it helps you to get started. And once you've got started, the more you read, the more easier it becomes to then find yet more in that narrower and narrower area that you are going to write about. And then, of course, so as you build the, that sort of list of sources, you start you making all of your notes, thinking deeply about what you want to write about, it becomes clearer and clearer. So you get that relationship between what you want to do, your problem area, and the body of knowledge. So as you're working in the smart device and um, social network side, as you start reading the articles from, the, from sociology, psychology, psychiatry, from child <coughs> development and education, you begin to understand the range of problems and opportunities and successes that smart devices, tablets, and so on, are bringing in the field to adults, to children, and so on. It helps you to produce that context. <coughs> now, some of the work you're going to be doing a bit later on in your career here, you're going to start doing some really active research into problems that you're going to set yourself based on a broad context, broad concept, that your lecturers give you for your assignments. So you need to understand what has been done to give you that context. You need to understand how it was done. You need to look at the different analytical processes that were used and the different data capture processes because that may be a source of a problem. The, the data capture was not very well designed. The analysis may be used suspect um, statistics, or may, may have made a whole range of assumptions which are not necessarily true today. If you think about the field of macroeconomics, around about every 10 to 15 years, for the last 40, 50, 60 years, major macroeconomic models have broken when, when um, society or the global environment has changed. And the most spectacular version of that was in 2008, 2009, <coughs> when the credit crunch happened. Interestingly, all of the macroeconomists still do not have a good working macroeconomic model of what's going to happen in or when the governments of the USA, the UK, uh, the EU start unwinding quantitative easing. <coughs> Nobody has a clue. They can't rebuild the mathematical model to advise the policymakers what to do. And this is really quite interesting. So, lots of research has been done. We know how the different macro models work in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s and up to about 2008. And since then, nobody really knows. So, what I'd like you to do this evening <coughs> is to find some research, or we'll do some research to find guidance on how to do literature research. How do you research for the literature? And build it into your working bibliography. A sort of resources that you build up. 
in, on your memory stick or your hard drive lots of interesting, useful sources that help you understand all these things. So you can go and refer to them as you go and do your work month by month, semester by semester. <coughs> lots of reading, I keep coming back to that one. But it, as you develop, whether it's in nets and security, whether it's in IT, computer science, CGP, and so on, keep reading widely in your field and across all of the fields. So, and your opportunity to consolidate this is in the subjects in computer science module that you're doing this term and next term. Because that exposes you all to things that are going on across the whole of the, all of those programs. Because you don't want to end up just narrow one little area. Because things that go on in other areas, whether if you're CGP, <coughs> you really do need to understand <coughs> what's happening in the field of networks, communication, and security. Because it impacts on how you design many of the games that are out there. If you think about what happened a year or so back when Sony um, had their PlayStation environment hacked and all sorts of things, partly <coughs> because people forgot to engineer security in at the very beginnings of the whole exercise. So that's just one example of how there is an impact between the two. So you want to understand the theories, the frameworks across the whole of what we're teaching you this, this year. Because that will help you as you develop into <coughs> the future and become really great employees. That's what we're really concentrating on, being able to get great employees. That you can be successful in your future career. And that means you need to understand the breadth, as well as the depth in your chosen field. And as you start doing your research, and this will come back to haunt you as you do your independent studies dissertation in a few years' time, you want to find out about what the gaps are. Because that's what's going to give you a really interesting project to do. And the guys who are working with me, worked with me last year and who are looking, working with me this year in location service and also solar uh, photovoltaic um, electricity generation are looking for the unsolved questions, the unanswered questions. And that means that their work then gets added into the body of knowledge and published. Which is kind of cool. But it actually makes a difference. The sort of work that they have done last year is going to lead to some very, very interesting work with some charities and other organisations who need to be able to look after their staff who are out in the wild, literally in the wilds of England, by themselves. And so we can come up with some ideas that will actually have an impact in terms of helping to provide a safer environment for those lone workers, based on the research that we're doing here. So that shows how it fits into the body of knowledge in relation to the gaps where we don't understand fully the accuracy and inaccuracy of these sort of things. That's why in a fortnight's time, Wayne is going to be doing this lecture, uh, we'll be doing the lecture this, uh, on Monday, because I'll be in Palo Alto giving a, a, a presentation to uh, a whole group of retailers and people involved in location <laughs> services, because the work that <coughs> students here have done start doing that research, what is the current state? What do we know? This is all part of building up that big body of knowledge in your head. Don't rely on being able to find the stuff again because you know how to Google it. A, that wastes time but much 
that having to re research for it and maybe not getting the search terms exactly the same, but it also means that you have forgotten it because it, our rate of recall, the latency of recall out of our brain, out of our memory, is very, very fast indeed. If we have to find it and then read it again, that could be 10, 20, 30 minutes. It's a little bit like the problem or the difference between having your operating system on your laptop or your PC on a spinning disk, however fast the disk is, and the boot up time if you have a solid state drive. If you've got a solid state drive, your PC boots in seconds, doesn't it? If you've got to load it off a hard drive, a spinning drive, 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds later perhaps, depending on the performance of that hard drive. But from solid state, like that, really, really fast. And the same thing with us. If you've got to go back to the paper or the electronic copy of it, that takes a while. From your memory, almost instantaneous. One of the things I've been talking to you about in the workshops about your article is using your information, your sources, to provide the basis that you can then write. It is not, we're not wanting you to write down, this author, brackets, 2015, says, or describes, or suggests, or asserts. That's just description. It's incredibly boring, most of the time, and it doesn't move your reader's understanding of where you're trying to get to any further. So it's a critical evaluation, comparing and contrasting and coming up with the really interesting gaps or synthesis building a thing together. You're looking for the strengths in the argument of the different sources, the strengths of different theories. You're looking at the gaps. You're looking for where people have carefully glossed over that here beeth magic bit, where Nice structure at the beginning, nice and logical, nice and logical towards the end. But somewhere in the middle is this rather fluffy, here be it magic. We're not quite sure how we get from here to here, but I think that there's a link. And you should be able to identify that sort of gap. So as you are developing your ideas, as you're developing your research through the literature, you're solve, putting your research question into context, you want to have it put it in the global perspective, the large picture. And as you remember, last week I was talking to you about getting out of the ditch and stop counting the petals on the daisies in the ditch. In each of your assignments, your approaches to your articles for this, for this project, uh, module, I keep saying, get out, higher, up to the level where you can see the shape of the whole problem. That's the real context. <coughs> and sometimes it's quite useful in your introduction in the context to explain why are you approaching that problem in the way you are. Why do you want to look at that particular problem? So it's why do you want to look at it, and how are you going to evaluate it? <coughs> so another little exercise for this evening. Find some sources. Add it to your working bibliography, of course. And think <coughs> about how this will help you over the next four or five weeks as you finally write that article that you're going to write and submit at the end of November. <coughs> what is the authority of those sources? Can we believe it? <coughs> you know, I mean, some people just take the view, well, it's, in, it's written down, it's there electronically, therefore it must 
be true. Is that correct? What sources do you know of where you're not sure of the accuracy or the validity or the authoritativeness of the sources? Wikipedia. Wikipedia, why is that? Because people write themselves, you can modify yourself. You can modify yourself, yeah, and uh, having trouble at the moment in recruiting another 11,000 editors to try and get on top of the uh, problems that are going on at the moment. Do you believe tweets on Twitter? Depends where it's at. Yeah, okay, that's a perfect thing to answer. How do you judge whether it's a believable source or not? How do you work out the credibility of that particular hash, uh, sort of source? Uh, it depends who you've put it on whether it's verified or not. Well, whether it's verified. How do you handle that? So it needs to be verified. But like, like, Oh, right, yeah. In Wikipedia or in uh, tweets as well? On the end of their username. Oh, I see. So you can tell whether the user ID, has, user hack tag has been verified. So you know then that Twitter knows who it is and they kind of track it down. But just because you've got that, does it mean that everything they say is actually trustable? Not entirely. Not entirely, quite. And one of the problems with Twitter is it's text only. So it means we can't see the body language, we can't hear the tone and pitch of voice. Well, if you put a uh, link at the end of it, where you can actually check out. They may have links as well, that's a good idea. Yep. And if you go back to the 1990s, the middle of the 1990s, the London um, uh, Lloyd's uh, insurers <coughs> implemented a new electronic system. And the idea was to have a document workflow match system like we've now got in many places between the brokers, the, the people who were try, uh, facing customers with insurance uh, policies and questions and risks and the underwriters always used to meet down in what used to be the Lloyd's coffee, coffee shop area. They still, it looked like it. And they would stand or sit there face to face. <coughs> and the idea of the new computer system that in the mid-90s was to avoid having to go and down into that sort of face-to-face -face area and do it remotely at a distance. And the underwriters got really, really touchy about it because they did not feel that they were able to trust pure text and, work and spreadsheets and so on. They wanted to be able to see the eyes of the... Of the um, the brokers and so on, to say, have you disclosed every appropriate aspect of the risk and be able to eyeball them and see their body language? Because trust ultimately is the centre of the insurance business. And you can actually find the whole of that case study in a book by a guy called Jeffrey Walsham, which is in the library and it's called... Um, IT in a global world, I think. It's something along those lines. <coughs> Jeffrey Walsham has a set of, of about 20 case studies, all set or developed during the 1990s, and they're all still valid in the lessons they give us today in terms of the questions we need to ask about the use of IT. And so <coughs> here we had authoritativeness and the ability to trust goes back to questions of face-to-face, -face. we're good at that. We're not so good at text. We tend to ascribe too much authority to text just because it is text. Now, when you are writing, <coughs> there are two ways of writing a well-researched piece of work. You can write it as a, lit a literature research or literature review on a he says, she says basis. In other words, blogs 2015 suggests that blah, 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 blah. And you could actually critically evaluate it as you're writing that, but you're still blogs 2015, Smith 2014, and so on. Now, there's a problem with that, that you then, there is a strong tendency to use 
many of the words that they use, because you just read it, or just reread it, so that you get that assertion captured there. And that then takes you close to the problem of quoting or not quoting. It also forces you into writing in the structure of the sequence of authors that you decided to use. <clears throat> what is actually much, much better, it's much more readable for the, the reader, uh, much more engaging, if you don't use a he says, she says form of quoting, of citing. So write what you have to say, what we call in your own voice or your own words, but then wherever you need to provide the justification to the source, bracket Smith 2015, blogs 2040. And then you are writing much, much more naturally. It becomes much easier to write that story that you're trying to convey. The storytelling that we're wanting you to all develop because that's one of the critical issues or critical skills that businesses want from all of you. Yes, they want the technical ones, as I've said before, but they want skills and communication. And telling the story of your research, telling the story of your application development, <coughs> requirement specification, in your own words, makes it much, much more compelling, much more persuasive to the listener. And so try not to use the according to blogs bracket 2015, blah, 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 and set the story yourself. Use your words, your voice. And that then means it's much easier to do compare and contrast, and much easier to pull the ideas together into the synthesis, the creation of something new, which we're looking for, but justified by those citations. <coughs> and you'll find one or two sources here at the end of this, so that you'll then be able to uh, come back to this and um, do really great research. So that's the end of this little bit, I think. And then I want to very briefly look at a different one, which is to do with some kind of digital um, <coughs> skills. Because there's research out today that there's 12 million people in the UK who are falling into the IT skills gap. Now, I hope most of you are not like that. And I want to just breeze through one or two critical parts of this so that you can see how to use Word to the best advantage. Because there's things that I'm fairly sure you may not yet have discovered. But you may have done it, so bear with me and use this as a resource that you can refer to on occasion. We talked a little bit last week about the structure. Oops. I want to talk a little bit, of, and that's really related to the assignment for this, this module, but I also want to think about other types of uh, writing, other types of reports we're going to need to. And there's a very good um, book in the library, Cornford and Smithson, which is about research projects in the field of IT, and there's a good one here about, a good chapter about writing the project itself. The usual broad structure, the sort of things that go on the cover page, what an abstract is for. The abstract is a short, pithy summary of the whole of the article, or the whole of the report. It talks only about what's in the report and what was actually achieved. The abstract never, ever has any citations or references. <coughs> and it's written, for the, in the majority of cases, the, all the ones that you're ever going to be uh, coming across with, until perhaps you are involved with PhD type research and writing into learned journal articles on a few occasions, but generally it's a sales statement, it's a marketing statement to persuade the reader why they need to invest some time into reading your article. 
The table of contents. How many of you know how to create a table of contents automatically? About half of you. Those who didn't put their hand up, how many of you know how to use the heading one, two, and three styles in Word? A few of you. Now, the reason for using those is because it tells Word how to actually automatically create the table of contents, which provides the reader with an outline of the structure of your report, which is effectively an outline of the structure of the way you are thinking about the problem, the way you start to attack the problem, and the way that you solve the problem. Those headings and subheadings and sub-subheadings should be chosen very, very carefully, because they will help the reader to understand the structure of your thoughts and your analysis. It stops the reader having to think too hard about what's going on. Each Sub subsection, which maybe has a paragraph or two underneath it, should be clearly related to what you're doing in those two paragraphs. It helps us to know, ah, this is what it's about, and then you fill in with the words. You might want a glossary in some reports, the bigger reports, with all of those TRAs, three-letter acronyms and four-letter acronyms. If you are doing a research type of report like you will do in two or three years' time, there we give you a very, very clear specification of the structure. I've given you a fairly clear structure uh, for this article, but I, I leave, I'm leaving you a little bit of latitude in what the wording is of the sort of two or three sec major sections in your article. It's going to vary according to the focus. But you must choose those header one levels, and header two and three levels if you use them, to really help the reader understand the focus of that next chunk of text. Unless you are told differently, most of the time in the, <coughs> the Department of Computing and Maths, we want you to use the Harvard standard. Occasionally, you may be asked, for very specific reasons to use a different one. And then the lecturer or tutor will give you guidance on how to do that. But use Harvard, and Harvard does not normally have numbers for each item in the bibliography. So it should just be a sorted list in surname order. And it's incredibly easy to do. You can just select the whole of your bibliography, if it's not sorted, and then use, well, it's not actually a uh, table draw now, it's a slightly different one, which I'll show you. So, do you know how to do this, how to sort that lot? Anybody know how to sort it? A very small number. Right, all you have to do is... is to go to that arrow there, or, yeah, home, and then to the down arrow, and leave that paragraph text, click OK, and watch what happens to those entries there all sorted for you. Doesn't that save a lot of time, folks? I thought you might find it. Anyway, the example is there in course resources. You can play with your heart's content. Oi! Not finished yet. As 
you write, and this is applicable to everything that you write from now on, know your reader. Who are you writing for? For your article, maybe you're writing for your family. You're certainly writing for me and Wayne. Your friends, relatives. Later on, you'll be writing for your managers, your supervisor. You'll be writing for customers. You'll be writing for programmers. You'll be writing for a whole range of different sorts of people. The point is, your readership governs how you will choose your words. If they don't understand what you are writing, it's not their fault, it is your fault. There was a lovely example a few a year or two ago of a politician who had put out a policy and everybody said this is complete rubbish. And his response was, well, they didn't understand what I was saying. That's their problem. Nope. As a politician, a person who uses words for their living, it is clearly and only his problem. He must communicate in ways that his audience or audiences will understand. The same goes for everything that you write. The responsibility is the author, the speaker, and not the reader or the listener. So think about who your reader is. Every article you write, every dissertation you, project dissertation you write, every report you write, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it should have a nice logical structure from the beginning to the end. This last point is really important. In the field that we are working on here in IT, in computing, computer science, and so on, there is almost no point whatsoever in providing a quotation. Because of several factors. One, we are the readers, certainly as academic readers, are pretty blind. We use mental snow paint because we're not interested in the cut and paste, the accuracy of the typing. We are using your assessment reports and writing essentially to look inside your heads to understand how you think, understand the quality of your thinking, understand the quality of your analysis, the logic that you're using. And so a quotation does not contribute one iota to that journey of understanding. So don't bother to put the quotation, because in any case you will need to provide an explanation of why that quotation is relevant. What does it mean in the context of what you are trying to do with your <coughs> argument? So don't bother with quotations, however short or however long. Because if you do put quotations, and the same goes for pictures, images, tables of data, um, graphs, and so on. You have to put the interpretation of that information in your own words. Because you are doing the thinking and the writing. The reader should not be required to do any thinking about what does that table of data mean. The reader is there to understand your persuasive logic and agree with them, ultimately. That's what you're trying to achieve. Only use important material and explain the importance and validity and relevance of all that you put in there. Oh, and a final item before we finish. Please use the spell checker sensibly and intelligently. Use the grammar checker. Revise your work all the time. So when you've come back to your work, you spent a day or two writing it, and then you had a, a break, and then you come back to it, and you're going to set aside an hour or two to develop the next part of your uh, writing. First things first, go and revise, review everything you've written so far. Is it logical? Is it grammatical? <coughs> Does it actually mean what you want it to mean? But when you come back, you will often find, ah, 
maybe doesn't quite mean what I thought it meant or that I wanted it to mean. Get a friend to read it with you or relative. See how they understand it. I'll leave you there. <clears throat> Find the rest of it, folks, if you want to develop the ideas a little bit more. But thank you very much, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Bring the clicker, please. <laughs>